Time has proven him wise. But from free Greek to free Greek, the word was spread that bold Leonidas and his 300, so far from home, laid down their lives, not just for Sparta, but for all Greece and the promise this country holds. Now, here on this rugged patch of earth, quote the tear, that is Ford's face of liberation! Oh! Yet they stare now across the plain at 10,000 Spartans commanding 30,000 free Greeks. Oh! 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 The enemy outnumbers a poultry three to one. The large variety Greek. The victory! That's the scene from the movie 300. It's about the killer battle of Thermopylae, which was that moment in history that gave birth to Greek nationalism. It was a huge moment in Western history. Greece. It's one of the oldest Western civilizations. In fact, it's the foundation of Western culture and the birthplace of democracy. But as a nation, it didn't really exist until 1832. Really? You would think in its long history, Greece would have united a long time ago. I mean, when we think of Greece, we think of the classic icons like architecture, philosophy, science, art, and most important to us, democracy. But all that came from nothing more than a geographic region in the Mediterranean with independent city-states. And you've heard of these city-states, Athens, Sparta, and even Thesbia. By the way, the real name for Greece is Hellas. Nobody really seems to know how that came to be, but it did somewhere around the time Homer was writing the Iliad. Anyway, until modern times, if you were a Greek or a Hellen, you thought of yourself as a Spartan, Athenian, or Thespian. Why? Someone who can answer that is Richard Gabriel, author and professor. You might have even seen him on the History Channel. So, what can I do to help? Um, well, I have a couple questions here. Um, I'll start off with, um, do you think the city-states would ever have realized themselves as Greeks if Thermopylae hadn't happened? Uh, if you look at the history uh, of Greece, where it came from, uh, basically a remnant of the Aryan migration of warrior cultures and tribes, uh, once they settled in Greece, then they repeated, they, they entered the pattern of city-states that fought one another for centuries because that's what they had done when they were an Aryan culture in the, in the Ukraine. Uh, you see the same pattern of city-states fighting each other for hundreds of years. If you look at the rest of the Aryan population, which settled in India, what mattered most was the warrior culture and the tribe and status of the tribe than any sense of statehood. They didn't even really much have a sense of statehood as you and I would understand. Okay, it was more tribalism than anything else. Under conditions like that, when you talk about Greece, per se, it's really a mere geographic expression, you know? I mean, it's the same peninsula, and it's the same people, but they never saw themselves as, as, as the same people. They fought one another enormously, and they were also radically different culture. Uh, you know, the states of Sparta, as you well know, military state, uh, radically different than the, the civilian states, which we speak of Athens. So, um, do you think Athens was the real driver of the idea of Greek nationalism? Now, when challenged from outside, the, uh, the Athenians who were protecting their own interests uh, essentially tried to form uh, a, a, an alliance against the Persians. On the grounds that we're all Greeks, uh, but not very many people believed it. Not many people joined the alliance, uh, and in the middle of the wars. Uh, Groups defected all the time. I mean, the defeat of Thermopylae was a result of when the groups went home. So it's hard to argue that there was any sense of Greek nationalism from the beginning to the end. A clear identification with a larger uh, uh, entity, political entity, beyond the city-state, 
All right, like for example, you're a Texan, I'm a New Hampshire type, but we're both quote Americans. Okay, that kind of thing uh, never really uh, developed, which as far as I can see. True enough, Athens tried to stimulate it, but for its own narrow self-interest. And it's been Athens that had deserted one one uh, uh, coalition after another over the years for its own self-interest. Maybe the idea of being Greek was fake, but city-states still came together at Thermopylae. How did that come about? Well, again, Athens. The Greeks had colonies from Sicily to Ionia, which is modern Turkey. But in ancient times, Ionia was part of the Persian Empire. The Ionian colonies didn't like being part of Persia, and in 499 BC, they broke out in total revolt. The Ionians burned the capital city of Sardis. This alone would be bad enough. But what really lit the angry fire in the Persians was that Athens had sent soldiers to help their Greek cousins. The Persian king at the time got really ticked, and that set the stage. At first, the Persians were really after the Athenians because they sent troops to help the Ionian revolt. Persia lost. They kind of stewed about this for another ten years. And then, the Persian king Xerxes brought a huge army to Thermopylae. That was where King Leonidas led 300 Spartans against a million Persians. That's the legend. True, there were only 300 Spartan soldiers but they were accompanied by more than 7,000 Greek soldiers and 200 ships from other Greek city-states. Athenian, Arcadians, Thespians, Phoetians, and more. And they stood against a massive Persian invasion. The real histories of the battle estimate the army to be at least 300,000 strong, supported by over a thousand ships. Xerxes did try negotiations, offering Leonidas governorship and control of all Greece, if he submitted to Persia. According to Plutarch, Leonidas said, I would rather die for the liberty of Greece than become a monarch over my countrymen. Overactor. Persia won the battle, but lost the war of history. Thermopylae is still a huge source of Greek pride. And only 300 Spartans stayed with the goal of delaying the Persian army so they could give uh, to the Athenians time to prepare to evacuate the city. So they knew they would die, you know, they just they stay there knowing they would die, mm -hmm. which is something remarkable, I think. The catalyst for this unification was uh, the external threat. It's hard for me to believe that without this external threat there would be uh, a reason or incentive for this uh, uh, city-states to be transformed to something different. Look at Greek politics this way. It's like you and your siblings. You beat the crud out of each other. That's okay. But when somebody messes with them, you team up to protect each other. In fact, Plato made this argument in his work, The Republic. And therefore, when Hellens fight with barbarians and barbarians with Hellens, they will be described by us as being at war when they fight and by nature enemies, and this kind of antagonism should be called war. But when Hellens fight with one another, and we shall say that Hellas is in the state of disorder and discord, they being by nature friends, and such enmity is to be called discord. So many ancient and modern scholars agree that Thermopylae was a turning point in Greek politics. If that's true, what happened? Why didn't it stick? Apparently, the Greeks have a problem developing what advertising people call a brand identity. Also, it had to do with some selfishness, especially on the part of Athens and Sparta. Another ancient historian, Trogus, said that Athens and Sparta competed for control of other city-states and each other. They made other Greeks choose sides. It made for a split people. Alright, so the Greeks had a problem with keeping it together. But for one brief, shining moment in their history, they did get it together. That was a good thing, because maybe a small piece of that Hellenic revolution is still going on. That's because democracy was allowed to happen, and from those seeds came the United States of America.